So real quick question to get us started off. How many of you have ever heard of the saying, hero to goat? Uh, and this may be an age difference right now because when we hear the word goat now, especially the younger generation, they think goat as the greatest of all time. That's what the acronym stands for as athletes. But there is this saying that went around for a long time that said, uh, hero to goat. And what this references is, is when someone does something really well in one moment, but the next day moment they screw it all up somehow. And so this is actually a very, this was a very common saying in sports for a long time. Uh, we see as examples someone like a Lance Armstrong. He was this hero in America for a long time, winning all the Tour de France's, cancer survivor, all these things. And then he became the goat as like someone we kind of shunned and made fun of because he found out he cheated that entire time by using steroids and and not playing uh, fairly, you know, not, not, not cycling fairly against his competitors. Or one of my favorite hero to goat moments is actually one of my first experiences I remember watching sports as a kid, and that was the Super Bowl in 1993 of Cowboys versus the Buffalo Bills, and Leon Lett went from hero to goat. Leon Lett was this defensive lineman for the Cowboys. He was a big boy, and he recovered a fumble and was on his way, which to which would have been the longest fumble return for a touchdown in Super Bowl history, and a big boy was doing it. And like, so anytime a, a lineman scores a touchdown, it's a celebration in football because they don't do that very often. So this big boy, Leon Lett, is running down the field in the Super Bowl, the biggest game of his life. He's about to set a record. Everyone's cheering. He's becoming this big, he's going to be this folk hero in Dallas Cowboy history because of this one moment. And he's running down the field, probably starting to huff and puff. And then he gets really cocky. He's getting to the 15, 10 yard line. He's almost there. And he starts kind of showboating and kind of holding the ball out like this instead of keeping it close. And he's just celebrating the fact that he's about to score a touchdown. But right before he scores a touchdown, Don Beebe, receiver for the Buffalo Bills, sprints down the field and he knocks the ball out of Leon Lett's hands, causing him the fumble, causing the ball to actually go out of the end zone, which gave the ball back to the Buffalo Bills. And so Leon Lett from, went from this moment of being this hero, doing something amazing, to screwing it all up. And now everybody makes fun of him. When we think back of football moments, he is a goat in that moment because he totally screwed it up. And so this hero to goat mentality, sometimes it happens because of an unintentional mistake or sometimes because of that hero being selfish and stupid like Leon Lett was in that moment. And today, as we continue to look at Peter's life, as he shares his experience about his life with Jesus, we're going to see his hero to goat moment where one moment he was this hero, someone we could look up to as followers of Jesus, and the very next he screws it all up, and we'll get into that in a moment because we are continuing our You're Not Far series, and we're going through Jesus' ministry and his life through Peter's perspective. Peter, at one point in his life, sat down with a guy named John Mark, and he told him, here's what happened with my life with Jesus. And here's what Jesus did. Here's what he taught. Here's the miracles he performed. And he gave that to John Mark. And Mark, John Mark wrote this down. And we have that account in our Bibles. It's known as the Gospel of Mark uh, that we have access to. And it's wonderful. But we're seeing in this series that because of, because of Jesus, the story that Peter told, because of Jesus, we are not far from God. And let me just remind that with you right now. Whoever you are, wherever your background is with your, your relationship with God, whatever your faith journey has, has been, I want to remind you something. You're not far from God because you have access to Jesus. Jesus came, he walked this earth, he taught us, he did his ministry, he died and resurrected again. And because of Jesus, you and I don't have to be far from God. And we are celebrating that as we are going throughout this series together. 
But it's really interesting as we've been doing this, we've been looking at Jesus' life through Peter's perspective, and it's really cool to kind of see some of Peter's personal aspects of his, of his story being told. You know, sometimes Peter will tell, uh, sometimes he'll leave out some personal things about him and his experience with Jesus that we read in the other gospel accounts in, Mar uh, in Matthew and Luke and John. They record stuff about Peter that Peter doesn't tell Mark to write down. Uh, other times he'll be very open and honest about his own experiences with Jesus. And today he's open and honest that we're seeing, uh, we're going to see here in a moment about one of his probably biggest failures in life. And in his failure, we'll see that his mistake is actually one that we often make when it comes to Jesus as well. That we may have faith in Jesus, we love Jesus, we follow Jesus, but sometimes we put our own personal agenda onto Jesus and rather, rather than taking Jesus' mission and agenda onto our own lives. You see, last week we saw Peter's greatest moment as we were continuing this series. We saw Peter proclaim Jesus to be the Messiah, that he was God's anointed savior of the universe. And Peter got to the point where we all need to be in our lives, where we declare Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so last week we left it off as Peter, and he's the hero. He is like this, this man that we're like, we want to be like Peter, that he's declaring his ultimate faith in Jesus, that he's the Messiah. And it was a great heroic moment. Jesus commended him for it and celebrated him for it. And now, right after this scene, as we continue in our series, we're about to see Peter become a goat. He screws it all up. You see, Jesus uses that moment of Peter and the apostles as a pivot point for his teaching, actually. After he, you know, they declared him as Messiah, Jesus says, okay, now we can do something more about this. Okay, now that they know and believe that I am the Messiah, now they need to understand what the Messiah has to do. And we see a huge pivoting moment in what Jesus was teaching his followers. And then Mark 8, 31, this is what is recorded. He says, he then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. And so Jesus starts telling them that he is going to die and then come back in three days, uh, three days later. And this is the first time Jesus' apostles are hearing this. You know, and we have the benefit of hindsight that we know Jesus died, he resurrected, we have that faith in that, but this is the first time the apostles hear that. And for the apostles, what they hear is, I'm going to be killed, and they can't believe it. They must have ignored or for, you know, missed the point where Jesus said, I'm going to come back to life three days later. They just hear, I'm going to be killed. And this is why it was a big deal to them. Because the Jews in that day, they believed the Messiah would set up an earthly kingdom, that he would have this physical kingdom on earth, that Israel and Jerusalem would be the epicenter of this amazing kingdom that God was orchestrating, and this Messiah, the one they had been waiting for for so long, he would be the king of that. And so if he was going to die, as Jesus was saying he was about to die, well, then they can't have this physical kingdom because their king would be dead. And this completely this defeats the purpose of what they were hoping this Messiah would do. But death was necessary for Jesus, And this is what he starts teaching them in this moment for the first time, that him dying is part of God's plan. It was going to fulfill God's ultimate plan to bring us close to him because Jesus dying was the way to pay the ransom and the penalty for yours and mine and everybody else's sin. The apostles just didn't know that yet. And so Jesus starts teaching this to the apostles, starts telling them I'm about to die, and then Peter steps in. And we see this in verse 32. Uh, it continues, Mark continues to write, he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. And so Peter's like, hey, Jesus, I know I just called you the Messiah and everything, like literally like just a couple days ago, but here's the, dish, here's the issue. You can't be saying this stuff. Like, what the heck are you doing? You can't be telling us that you're going to die now because we just believe, we just declare that you're the Messiah. You're the anointed one of God. You're the one who's going to set up this earthly kingdom for us. You can't do that if you're dead. So stop talking about this. Stop saying this. Jesus, you're wrong. This can't be the case. And basically he's saying, God forbid you ever ever die because God is going to set you up with this earthly kingdom and you're going to rescue all of us from the Roman Empire, from all of our enemies, and we are going to be safe and secure here on earth in our earthly kingdom. And so Peter starts rebuking Jesus, like calling him out. It's like, Jesus, what are you doing? You're wrong here. And maybe his motives were pure, but Peter was drastically wrong in this moment. 
And Jesus lets them know it in a pretty intense way. Very next verse. But when Jesus, verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Jesus hears Peter's rebuke. Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, what are you doing, Jesus? You can't be saying this. You can't be thinking this. This cannot happen. And so Jesus gets rebuked by Peter. So then Jesus rebukes Peter himself. And he looks at the rest of the apostles and he turns to all of them and he lays in the Peter by saying, get behind me, Satan. I'm like, imagine this moment here for a second. In this scene right before this, Peter is calling Jesus the Messiah and Jesus is commending Peter for it and celebrating Peter for it. And the very next scene after Peter's heroic moment, Jesus is now calling Peter Satan. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want Jesus ever calling me Satan. That that may be the worst thing that that Jesus could ever call uh, one of us. But he calls Peter Satan. And, uh, you know, imagine this moment. Imagine Peter's response and the other apostles' response to that. You know, Peter just has his greatest moment ever right before this. And now he's being called Satan. Now, just to be clear, Jesus isn't literally calling Peter the devil in that moment. What he's using, he's using that word Satan because it's, it, what it means is literally means adversary. And Peter was getting in the way of Jesus's mission by rebuking Jesus by saying, no, Jesus, you can't die. This can't be the way. This isn't what God intends for you. And Jesus is like, go back off, Satan. Get away from me, adversary, because you're missing the point here. You're missing what God is doing through me and for you because of the mission that he has called me out to do. And so Peter's greatest moment is followed by human failure. He went from declaring Jesus as Messiah and being celebrated by that by Jesus to being called Satan. And his human failure is something we all can mess up with. Uh, But the reason Peter messed up here is because He had his own concerns in mind and not God's. Jesus even said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter was focused on his own desires and expectations of what Jesus was all about, and he missed the bigger picture in this moment. And you and I, we can often do the same thing. You know, we believe in Jesus, we love Jesus, we follow Jesus, because Peter's doing that. He loves Jesus, he's following him in this moment. But often we can project our own wants and our own desires onto Jesus, and we'll assume that's what he'll do. He'll just do whatever we want him to to do. Yes, we believe in Jesus to be Lord, but that means he'll then bless us with more money because we expect him to do that or give us a better job or heal the sickness every time or make sure our preferred political party wins the election. He want, we want him to establish our own personal kingdom first rather than him establishing his kingdom in our lives over top of ours. And so we focus on our own concerns rather than God's Concerns, And this is what Peter falls into. This is the trap he falls into. And when that doesn't happen for Peter and doesn't happen for us in our lives, often we can think, what the heck, Jesus? Like, where are you at on this? You can't be doing this. You need to be doing what I expect you to do. And when we do this, we get lost just like Peter did. We're focused on human concerns over God's concerns. And we start thinking, what's in it for me rather than what is God doing and how can I follow him in that? And Jesus has given his followers, uh, what he had to do in this moment is he had to give them the right understanding of what he was all about, what the Messiah came to do. Yes, he was the Christ. Yes, he was prophet, priest, and king. Yes, he was the Messiah like they declared him to be. But while his followers were expecting this earthly kingdom, Jesus was building and setting up a heavenly kingdom that would never falter. It would never fall, and hell will not bring this thing down. And so Jesus had to reorder their thinking on heavenly things rather than earthly things. And we need that same shift of thinking in our own lives when it comes to following Jesus too. And so Jesus has this moment with Peter and his apostles, and then he uses this as a teaching example like he always does so well for the apostles and the gathering crowds around him. In the next following verses, verses 34 through 38, this is what takes place. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? 
If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. And Jesus addresses the disciples in the gathering crowd, and he resets the tone and the expectations for following him. He kind of lays out the cost of what it is to follow him. And he's dealt with this before. This isn't something new for Jesus, but again, he's recalibrating, he's refocusing their understanding and their expectations on who he is and what the Messiah is all about. Oftentimes, people came to Jesus for him to fix everything rather than for them to follow him. And people came looking for signs, and they were ignoring what Jesus had already done up to that point. But to follow Jesus, he teaches, it means we have to die to ourselves. He says we have to deny ourselves that whatever we want in our own lives, that takes a back seat, or maybe it even gets completely eliminated compared to what Jesus is asking us to do in life. That we have to deny our own desires for the sake of Jesus's. And he says to take up our cross daily and follow him. And for that crowd to hear that, that would have been shocking to them. That would have been humiliating to them because the cross was the most humiliating way to die. This was an invention of the Roman Empire and it was specifically invented to make people suffer, to humiliate them, and to remind the people around them that they are not in control, that Rome is in control, their lives are not their own. And if they kill them by crucifying them on a cross, it's a reminder to the crowd and the witnesses like, oh yeah, we're not in charge. And so Jesus is saying, if you want to follow me, you need to you know, take up your cross daily and follow me. Because when you were crucified on a cross, you were expected to take your cross and carry it through town for everybody to see you, to be humiliated by everyone. They would mock you. They would jeer you. They would make fun of you. They would do all these things to remind you of what your impending death was coming to. And Jesus is saying, if anyone wants to follow me, this is the mentality you have to have. Your life is not your own anymore. If you follow Jesus, you give up your own life for the sake of following him. So here's the question I have. If you follow Jesus, can anyone tell that by the way you live your life? Do they see sacrifices being made? Do they they see priorities being reset? Do they see a worship of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done in every aspect of your life? You see, the idea of taking up your cross was a difficult thing for the crowd to hear in the context that Jesus was speaking in. And maybe we miss it sometimes because we tend to kind of glorify the cross and, and in kind of a, sometimes in a good way because we celebrate the fact that Jesus died on the cross but resurrected, defeating death. But we have to understand when Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you have to take up your cross daily. That was something that was difficult to hear in that context. And we need to hear that now as well. That we have to give up our own lives for the sake of following Jesus. And if something gets in the way of that, we have to kill whatever that thing is, that desire is, that habit is, that struggle is, in order to follow Jesus. And Jesus is like, if you want to follow me, then you need to die to yourself. Then he just essentially lays out what the cost is. He says, don't sell your soul for a temporary pleasure. What good of it is if you gain the entire world? And Jesus is like, if what good is it if you gain all of the goals and dreams and monetary possessions that you desire in life? What's the good if you do all that stuff and yet lose your own soul because you missed the point and you missed me? What's the point of that? He's saying, don't sell your soul for temporary earthly pleasures. And he says that right after he's telling his apostles this about him dying, because he's basically saying, don't sell your soul. Don't miss the point for this earthly kingdom when I am setting something up that's so much greater, your mind can't even wrap itself around it. Because what I am doing, who I am, what I am setting up, Jesus is telling them, is way more worthy than your earthly things. Don't miss that. Don't give up your earthly possessions for, you know, don't give up your heavenly possessions for something temporary, for something earthly. And this is what it comes down to. Are we more concerned with God's stuff? Are we more concerned with our own stuff? And this is a good test. If we start saying in our lives, say, if you say something like this, I'll get to God, I'll get to the God stuff eventually, but first I, and then fill in that blank, that's a good indication that we're focusing on our own desires and our own concerns rather than God's. And so Jesus is laying out that there is a cost to following him. There is a cost to discipleship. It's not all pleasure. It's not all good moments. And for the apostles, uh, for the apostles, their Messiah, Jesus, is about to die. He's teaching them this. He's telling them this. 
Because if this is the mission and this is the, the, the calling that God gave Jesus. And actually for the apostles themselves, they learned this later in life that because of their faith, they would give up their earthly possessions for the sake of something greater because they themselves, all except for one of them, would eventually be killed for their faith as well. So they eventually got it. And so Peter himself eventually got it. But in this moment, he was focused on his own stuff. But what Jesus is trying to get them to understand is that the investment in him over the investment in our earthly desires is worth it. It's going to pay off. You see, following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. It takes sacrifice. It takes humility. It takes repentance. But most importantly, it takes knowing who and what we're following. And for us, we need to realize and remember that we follow a heavenly Savior, not an earthly ruler. Jesus did not come up to, come to set some earthly uh, kingdom. And obviously we see that because he's not here. He's not sitting on a throne here on earth right now. God's plan was for Jesus to lay down his life to pay the ransom for our sins. And God longs to rescue and restore people back into relationship with him both now and for eternity. And it has nothing to do with a physical kingdom here on earth. But so often what we try to do is we try to take our faith in Jesus and turn it into this earthly, physical kingdom that we want Jesus to make everything perfect here for us on earth, that we want our, our kingdom set up in our lives, in our countries, in our world. We want everything to be perfect based off what we desire in life. And we miss that he set up something way more worthy, way more valuable, way uh, more amazing. And that is a heavenly kingdom that takes place now on earth, but will continue forever and ever. But oftentimes, our human concerns can get in the way of that, and we try to build our own kingdoms. We spend a lot of time building our own comforts and chasing after our own goals and chasing after our own desires, and we give no sense of wondering, does this line up with what Jesus is calling me to do? And say what we do is, hey, hey, Jesus, line up with what, what I want to do in life. Hey, these goals that I have, bless me in those things because this is what I want to do in life without even realizing that maybe sometimes that we do, as pure as they may be, the, the, the good motives that we may have in those, in those situations, we may be missing the point of what Jesus is calling us to do. We want Jesus to build our own kingdoms, but Jesus wants us to focus on God's kingdoms and concerns, not our own to love God and to love our neighbors, to look to glorify and worship God in everything we do, to realize that life on earth is temporary, that there is something much greater in the end through Jesus Christ, and we need to reorder our thinking of following Jesus, that he's our heavenly Savior, not an earthly ruler. And if we're going to realize this, then we have to understand that there is a cost to follow him. To follow him will cost us. One of the biggest lies we have believed in our culture is that following Jesus is easy. We don't go into it thinking that we need to sacrifice or that it will cost us anything to follow Jesus, but this simply, one church, is not true. Jesus says if we want to follow him, we have to carry our cross. This is not some casual comment by Jesus. This is a command he gives us. It's not an optional route. This is something we have to do. It has to cost us to follow Jesus. So when's the last time following Jesus cost you anything? I mean, think about that question for a second. It's probably something we don't think of very often. When's the last time following Jesus cost you anything? When's the last time it cost you any financial gain or prominence and power or status? When's the last time it maybe it cost you a relationship or comfort or it made you give up a dream or some of your possessions or whatever it may be? When's the last time following Jesus cost you anything? And if you're struggling to answer that question, I'm willing to bet that maybe your faith has become casual. I'm not saying that to be a jerk because the truth is I can easily fall in this routine too. I'm saying it because I know this is how we can act as humans. And we get really comfortable with our faith and following Jesus doesn't cost us a thing because we're more focused on human concerns than God's concerns. I'm saying this because this is what we have to pay attention to. There are things in our lives that we hold on to that God may be saying to us, if we're paying attention, yeah, you know that thing, whatever that may be, yeah, it's getting in the way of following me. And if you want to follow me, if you really believe that I'm Lord, that I'm Messiah, that I'm the Savior of your life, then you may need to give that thing up or change how that thing operates in your life, whatever that may be. Because oftentimes we get so comfortable with our own lives that there's no need for God. 
You see, without discomfort and without cost, there's no need for faith and there's no need to rely on God. If everything's going well and our own personal kingdoms are being built up perfectly, we don't need God for any of it because we're focused on ourselves. But we need discomfort. We need cost for us to truly trust in God. That's where he transforms our lives. So when Jesus says that if you want to follow me, it'll cost, then we have to believe that. But in doing so, Jesus promises that's where we'll really find life. And so it costs us to follow him. But in that cost, Jesus promises the investment is worth it. When we follow Jesus by carrying our cross, it will not be easy. It will cost us, but Jesus is worth it. We just have to have that right understanding and that right perspective. And shortly after these moments, Jesus kind of gives a glimpse of how worth it is. It is to a few of his followers. About a week after this teaching takes place, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John, his inner three. So he had his 12 apostles, but he had his inner three. These were his closest followers, the ones he really invested in, the ones he poured his life into, some of his closest friends, Peter, James, and John. He takes them up onto this mountain. And up on this mountain, something crazy happens, something fantastic happens, something that we can't even wrap our brain around fully happens. But basically, Jesus is known as the transfiguration. Jesus' appearance changes. And, and what Mark writes, was what, this is Peter telling Mark, and Mark writes this down. Basically, what Mark writes is that Jesus' appearance changes, and he becomes what's, what he wrote down as dazzling white. And basically, the, the Greek word we see here is it's the most pure form of white you can have. It's just he's shining glory. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here. He doesn't have this like human form anymore. His glory is shining through. It's whiter than anything they've ever seen in this symbol symbolize the purity and the glory of who Jesus is. And we're starting to see that we're not just, he's not just this human teacher. He is this divine being. He is God in the flesh and he's showing them his glory. And as he's doing this, two people show up with them and Moses and Elijah. And Moses and Elijah for Jewish people like Peter, James, and John, this was huge because their entire Jewish faith before Jesus was all hung up on Moses and Elijah because Moses represented all of the laws they followed. Moses you know, imp implemented so many of those laws. He orchestrated those. He got Israel's kingdom going. And so they're like, Moses is amazing. He's like one of like the greatest people we honor and celebrate. And then Elijah, he kind of represents all the prophets that came later later that God sent to remind people, hey, this is what I want you to do. Here's the purpose of what it looks like to be my people. And so Elijah represents all these prophets as well. And so like, oh my gosh, it's, it's Moses, it's Elijah, it's Jesus shining in this dazzling white. This is amazing. For them, they have the three greatest people ever in this moment. Peter, James, and John, their minds are probably blown. In fact, in other accounts, in Matthew's account, they just dropped to the ground because it was so... Amazing. And so we have you know, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and they're seeing Jesus in this moment. And they're seeing who he is. They're seeing that he's the Messiah. They're seeing that he is worth it because they're seeing he is not just this human person setting up this earthly kingdom. He is God in the flesh. They're seeing his divinity in this moment. And Peter kind of jumps up and kind of says like, hey, this is really cool, Jesus. Let's build three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. And Peter just, he kind of has a foot-shaped mouth. He likes to stick his foot in it and just kind of screw up. But he just wants to stay in this moment because he thinks it's so amazing. But as he's saying this, God the Father interrupts him. So picture this crazy scene. Jesus is looking the way he is. Moses and Elijah are there. Moses, Elijah, and Jesus, they're talking in this moment. They're probably talking about what's to come, hint, the cross. They're kind of reminding Jesus, hey, here's what's coming to you soon. And God interrupts him as Peter is saying, hey, Jesus, let's, let's build these tents for you three to stay in. And he, he shows up with a, in a cloud. And for a Jewish person like Peter, James, and John, a cloud would have blown their mind because this is how often God would reveal himself in the Old Testament. It was a sign of the glory of God. So this cloud shows up in the midst of Moses, Elijah, and Jesus looking and transforming the way he did. And the voice of God speaks up. It says in verse 7, Mark 9, verse 7, it says, Then a cloud appeared and it covered them, and a voice came from the cloud. This is my son, whom I love, listen to him. Listen to him. 
And what's amazing about this moment is, is God essentially is telling Peter, James, and John, you want to know if Jesus is worth it? Listen to him. Because in this midst, they have Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And Moses and Elijah, you're not putting people over top of them when it comes to Old Testament history and the impact they made and the faith they had and what God did through them. Like Moses and Elijah, they're of the upper echelon. And they're probably blown away that they see Mo Moses and Elijah, you know, came from heaven to hang out with Jesus in this moment. Their, their minds are blown. But God doesn't say a single thing about them. He says, hey, Peter, James, and John. This Jesus is my son. This is the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And I love him. Listen to him. Listen to him. He is greater than the law and the prophets. He is superior to Moses and Elijah. He is my son. He is God. He is worth it. He's worth it. Because what he is doing is so much greater than what Moses ever did, what Elijah ever did, what your small minds could ever think of him doing by setting up an earthly kingdom. There's something greater at play here. Trust him. Listen to him. And after the tension of Jesus telling of his impending death and the cost of discipleship, the apostles couldn't believe it. But Jesus reveals his glory to just a few of them in this moment, showing them that following him is worth it. And this is the one thing I want us to walk away with today. And it's actually something I used to tell my students in youth ministry over and over and over again. It's this. Following Jesus isn't easy, but it's worth it. I mean, think about what Peter just went through. That He, was, he, he called Jesus the Messiah, thinking Jesus is going to set up this earthly kingdom. But Jesus says, nope, I'm going to die. I'm going to suffer. Things are not going to be good for a little bit. And it probably blew Peter's mind, the apostles' mind. It clearly shattered what they expected Jesus to do. But Jesus reminds them and teaches them and shows them through the transfiguration. It's going to be worth it, though. It won't be easy. It may not make sense sometimes. It may hurt. It may cost. But it's worth it. And this is what we need to be reminded of, too. It's not easy to follow Jesus. It shouldn't be easy. It can't be easy. But it's worth it. And this is the type of follower Jesus seeks out. For it to happen, we need to have the right understanding of who Jesus is and what he's calling us into. But in doing so, we can't get hung up on earthly struggles and earthly desires. We, will be, we have to be the witness to people to show, him what's, show people what's greater, and that's Jesus. So let me ask you again, what's it costing you to follow Jesus? Or what is the things in your life that's getting, the, getting in the way of following Jesus? Or things that you don't want to let go of because they're part of your own earthly kingdom. And maybe one of the biggest things you're holding on to is actually your own throne. That you like the idea of Jesus. You even love Jesus. You like following him to an extent, but you don't want to give up the throne of your life because you like building up your own earthly kingdom. And you know in your heart of hearts that that is getting in the way of what God is calling you to do when it comes to following Jesus. So let me ask you, are you willing to take, make, you know, pay the cost to give that up in order to make Jesus Lord of your life? And willing to test him and say, okay, God, let's see if you're worth it. Because the apostles came to believe that he was worth it. Followers for generations have been finding out that even with the cost of following Jesus, it's worth it. Because Jesus is God's son who God, who God loves, and he calls us to listen to him because he's worth it. So let's celebrate that fact together. Each week we worship Jesus through communion. We, we worship, we celebrate through uh, the bread and the juice that represents his body and blood. But this is our reminder that he's worth it. And so my encouragement for us is we're going to end our service today with communion. There's going to be nothing else afterwards today. We're just going to worship God through communion because it's our reminder that he is worth it. So if you have your, um, your, your communion supplies, grab them at home. If not, pause the, the stream you're watching right now and go grab your communion supplies, whatever that may be. But I want us to celebrate Jesus by being reminded that he's worth it through communion. And so together as one church, what we do is we take the bread that represents the body. We take that together. And together as one church, we drink the juice who represents his blood. And through communion, we are reminded 
And Jesus set up something much bigger, a heavenly kingdom over an earthly kingdom. And yes, we went through pain and, and he went through pain and suffering and it was not good in those moments, but in the end, it was worth it. And let that be hope to our lives. Let that be encouragement to our lives. That following Jesus isn't easy, but it's worth it. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for uh, this, this section of the book of Mark where we were reminded that we may have our own expectations of what you, what you do and what you're going to do in our lives. But God, I pray that for every one of us in this room or watching online right now, that those expectations get shattered compared to what you want us to do and what you're calling us to do and what you're all about. God, thank you for the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus did. God, thank you for the reminder that it does cost to follow him. So God, I pray that we have the faith and the courage to follow him no matter what the cost and continue to remind us that it's worth it because he is your son and you love him and he is worth listening to and following. So God, we praise you in that. We thank you for that. And we thank you for proving that through the cross and his death and resurrection. In your name we pray. Amen.